Today's topics will be electron negativity and bound polarity. Before we talk about details of the electron negativity and the bound polarity, but do you remember the little creature model we used when we were talking about the geometry of molecules? Yes, this is what we used. We treat two bounded atoms as two little creatures holding hands. Okay, we have two little creatures here, and they're holding a hand. Well, the hands they're holding are electrons shared in between. They're holding hands, okay, through the electrons shared. The two little creatures are playing the tug of war. Oh, last time we didn't say this. When they're holding hands, they are not simply holding their hands. Actually, the two little creatures are playing tug of war. Each little creature is positively charged. Positive how many? I just put three there. It could be more, could be less. And there are positive charges here, okay? Could be more, could be less. Well, since the electrons in between are, are negatively charged, so the two nuclei are pulling electrons towards themselves. So they are playing the tug of war. If they are playing the tug of war, now there's another question. Who is going to win? Okay. The two little creatures here are pulling electrons towards them. They're holding hands, pulling the hands towards themselves. Who is going to win? Well, it depends. If the two little creatures are of equal power, it's a draw. No one is going to win. Well, otherwise, whoever is stronger, that one is going to win. Now, here is another problem. If you put little creatures there and they are putting hands, playing tug of war, looking at them, I can tell kind of who is going to win. Whoever is stronger, that one is going to win. What about the atoms? How do I know which atom is going to win if they are trying to pull the electrons towards themselves? How do I know who is going to win? Here we go. Electron negativity. Electron negativity is the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract shared electrons to itself. Electron negativity is the concept we're going to use to evaluate which atom is stronger in terms of attracting electrons towards itself. And this is the trend of, period, uh, of electronegativity in periodic table. Going from, from left to right, electronegativity increases. From top to bottom, electronegativity decreases. So in the periodic table, electron negativity increases, electron negativity increases. We are excluding column number eight. Remember, column number eight elements, noble gases, are not interested in the chemical bonding. They stay by themselves. So the element in that corner, which is 7A, the element in that corner will be the element that has the highest electron negativity, which is true, which is fluorine. Fluorine is the strongest in terms of attracting electrons towards it. So when fluorine bonds with some other atoms, fluorine is going to win. It is going to pull electrons towards itself. Here we go. From left to right, from same period, is going to get higher and higher. Top, bottom top is going to get higher and higher. The electron negativity of fluorine is the highest. Actually, scientists has numbers assigned to them already. Well, knowing the trend of electron negativity in the periodic table is good enough for us. But I still want to explain why, when you go from left to right or bottom up, electronegativity increases 
okay, elements becomes more and more powerful in terms of attracting electrons towards it. So let's think about the elements in the same period first. Let's say going on from lithium to fluorine. Let's see, think what happens. So lithium has three protons in it. Fluorine has nine protons. Wait, wait I'm going to plan nine positive charges here. So nine protons in it. And since they are at the same period, period number two right now, they both have two layers of electrons, two shells of electrons. All right, so these electron shells, since both are two shells, they are the distance from shell number two, let's just consider the outermost shell, the distance from shell number two to the nucleus, from shell number two to the nucleus, are close. However, how close? Which one is farther? Which one is closer? Think about this. The difference from lithium, going from lithium to the right until fluorine, Every time you move from one shell, one spot to the next one, from lithium to beryllium, beryllium to boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, every time you move to the right by one spot, what happens? What happens is that you are putting one more proton into the nucleus, and you're adding one more electron to the outermost shell. Well, remember, a proton is 2,000 times as heavy as an electron. So when you put a proton here, the electrons in their outermost shell felt a lot more attraction from the nucleus than before. Think about the globe and yourself. Your mass compared with the mass of the globe is nothing. That's why you get attached to the globe. You cannot move yourself away from it. The globe is just too heavy. The mass is too huge for you to move yourself away from it, which is the case of an electron and a proton. The mass of proton, again, is two, about 2,000 times as much as the mass of electron. Therefore, when you add a proton to the nucleus, suddenly the electrons in the outermost shell feel a lot more attraction than before. As a result, when you put a proton in, the outermost shell electrons, the shell, all of them moves a little bit closer to the nucleus than before because they felt more attraction. Which means going from the left to right, every time you add a proton in, the outermost shell becomes closer and closer to the nucleus than before. Which also means, even though from lithium going to the fluorine, even though you're adding more protons and more electrons to the, to the atom, the atom is actually becoming smaller and smaller. The size of fluorine, although it has way more protons, electrons than lithium, the size of fluorine is actually a lot more smaller than the size of lithium. Now, when you add more protons, electrons feel more attraction. And now when they feel more attraction, they go closer to the nucleus. When they're closer to the nucleus, they feel even more attraction from the nucleus. So as a result, going left to right, the electron negativity increases in periodic table. Now let's consider the element from the same column. Let's again consider fluorine and chlorine here, in this case, period number two, period number three. All right, fluorine has nine proton, nine electron. Chlorine has 17 proton, 17 electrons. All right, Dr. Yang, I know you just said when you add more protons into the nucleus, electrons feel more attraction from it. The atom will be smaller, smaller, the electron negativity will increase. Based on what you told us, the chlorine will be way more electron negative than fluorine. 
the size of chlorine will be way smaller than the fluorine. How can you explain that? Well, that is because, in fact, the size of chlorine is way bigger than fluorine, actually, even though it has more protons, more electrons. Why? Because the new electrons added, actually, after the first nine, so electron number 10 to electron, electron number 17, the new electrons added to the chlorine are added to shell number three. They jumped to another shell. That when you increase another shell, the size of atom will increase dramatically. And when you are adding electrons from another shell, of course, this electron will feel less attraction from the nucleus than the next inner shell. Make sense to you? So overall, fluorine has the highest electronegativity. What is the general trend for electronegativity across the rows and down columns on the periodic table? All right, left to right from a row, electronegativity increases. Top, top to bottom, electronegativity decreases. Again, fluorine is the element that has the highest electronegativity. If lithium and fluorine react, which has more attraction? Of course, fluorine. Doesn't matter if lithium or anything else. Fluorine has the highest electronegativity. It has the most attraction for an electron. In the bond between fluorine and iodine, fluorine, iodine, both from column number seven, seven A, fluorine on the top, iodine close to the bottom, which has more attraction? Iodine, fluorine, they're bonded together. Of course, fluorine has more attraction. This electron, electron pairs, I'm going to use a pair of electrons now. Instead of being shared in the middle, this electron pair will stay closer to fluorine other than, other than uh, iodine. Make sense to you? In the bond between two carbon atoms, or two carbon atoms, there's a bond. Which one has more attraction? Wow, it has the same attraction. They're the same atom. So which means the electron pair between the two carbon atoms will be right in the middle area. It doesn't stay closer to the front one to the later one. It's somewhere in the middle. So now what do we see? We see there are actually two kinds of covalent bond. One has an unequal sharing. One has an equal sharing. These two kinds. These two kinds of covalent bonds are called nonpolar covalent bond and polar covalent bond. Nonpolar covalent bond has an equal sharing between the two atoms. Polar covalent bond, which is the case of hydrogen, nitrogen. So a nonpolar covalent bond could be single, double, or triple. Polar covalent bond, where you have an unequal sharing of electrons. When electron, when the two atoms bonded together are different in electron negativities, the bond will be polar. We know that this pair of electrons stay closer to chlorine. These three pairs of electrons stay closer to oxygen because there are more electron negative than the other one. A polar covalent bond creates a fraction of positive and a negative charge on the atoms. If this pair of electrons are not shared equally, it stays closer to chlorine. It feels like in the chlorine area, it has a partial negative charge. It is a partial charge is because it is the electron is not totally lost to chlorine. If it is totally lost, chlorine will carry one negative charge. In this case, they're still sharing, however, 
the pair stays closer to chlorine. So chlorine will have a fractional negative charge. Hydrogen will have a fractional positive charge. Electron stays a fractional charge. You use delta to represent a fraction of a charge, be it positive or negative. There's another way to represent a polar bond, which use an arrow to point to the atom that is more electron negative. You use a vertical bar to tell other people this, these are the shared electrons. It could be a single bond, double bond, or triple bond, but the shared electrons stays closer to the more electron negative atom. Now here's another question here. Can we have two kind of covalent bonds, a bond between hydrogen and the fluorine, and a bond between, between hydrogen and the bromine. The question is, which bond is more polar? Well, clearly, the pair of electrons here will stay closer to the fluorine more than the pair here stay closer to the bromine because fluorine is more electron negative, ne electron negative than uh, bromine. So the question here introduces another concept, which talks about uh, how polar it is about a polar bond, okay? That is called bond polarity, okay? Bond polarity measures the degree of inequality in the shared electrons between two atoms. The greater the electron negativity difference between the two bonded atoms, the greater the bond polarity. All right. The difference in electron negativity between the bonded atoms decides how much the shared electrons will move towards, will stay towards the more electron negative atom. The greater the difference, the more it will stay closer to the more electron negative atom. Arrange the following bonds from most to least polar. Okay, let me put the sequence of these elements in periodic table here so we can refer this to do that. So we have a carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. We also use silicon, so we have silica, silicon here. We have chlorine here. We have sulfur here. What else? Boron here. All right, this, this pretty much covers all the elements in the question. We're going to work on the first one together. You guys work on the other two by yourself later. All right, so NF, NF, two spots away from each other, each other. OF, O at the bottom, O and F. The difference of the electron negativities between F and O guaranteed will be smaller than the difference between electron negativities of F and N. Does that make sense to you? The, the electron negativity increases here from left to right. The farther away, the greater the difference between the two electron negativities. Does that make sense to you? Carbon F, next carbon F. Oh, carbon is here. The difference of the electron negativities between these two will be the highest among the three. Highest difference, most polar. Smallest difference, least polar. So from least, most to least polar, the answer should be CF. N, F, O, F. O, F, the electron negative difference is the smallest, is the least polar. Make sense to you? C, F, N, F, O, F. All right. Try, pause the video, do the B and the C. Once you're done, check the answer key. Here is the answer key.
Well, actually, there are some numbers we can use to predict whether a bound is polar or not, or if it's ionic or not. For nonpolar covalent bound, we earlier on the previous slides we said that okay, if two elements are identical, the bound will be nonpolar. Well, sometimes if the difference between the electronegativities of the two elements are small enough, we will consider that bound a nonpolar bound. So what's considered small enough if the difference is 0.4 or less? That's a nonpolar bound. If it is between 0.4 and 1.5, that's a polar covalent. If it is between 1.5 to 2, now you got to be careful because it could happen between two nonmetals. It could also happen between a metal and a nonmetal. Between 1.5, if the difference is between 1.5 to 2, if the two atoms are both nonmetals, then it is polar covalent. If the two elements, one is a metal, the other is a nonmetal, then it is ionic. If the difference is greater than 2.0, guaranteed, it will be a metal and nonmetal. It will be ionic. Try to memorize these numbers. Concept check. Which of the following bonds will be the least polar yet still be considered polar covalent? All right, least polar has the smallest electronegativity difference. If you look at the electronegativity difference between the two atoms, this one will have the smallest difference. The difference is zero. Both atoms are oxidized. Well, that is the smallest, however, the bond will be considered nonpolar bound. The question is asking you least polar, however, still need to be polar covalent. All right, so look at the others. That will be your answer. That's the element right next to each other, nitrogen and oxygen. It will have the smallest electronegativity difference other than the two oxygen atoms. Which of the following bonds would be the most polar without being considered ionic? Most polar should have the greatest electronegativity difference, but cannot be ionic. That means it cannot be between a metal and a nonmetal. So this is out. This is metal, nonmetal. All others are nonmetals. Now look at the most polar, the greatest electronegativity difference of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, silicon. All right. Oxygen, silicon will have the greatest electronegativity difference. That will be the answer. See you next time.